Hey there everyone, welcome back. I'm Raymond McNeil, host of Celtic Phoenix Productions. This is the fourth video in a series covering the Vic Mignogna vs Funimation et al. lawsuit. I recommend listening to the previous videos to get a better contextual sense for what's going to be said in this installment. Uh, today we'll be covering all the evidence provided by plaintiff Victor Mignogna. Now, before we jump into everything, there's a few updates we need to cover as there has been some motion in the case though uh, this is more on a sideways manner than any anything else. Vic and his legal team have asked for an extension to the appeals court for their appeals brief submission deadline, pushing the deadline back to February 18th. Meanwhile, defendants Monica Rial and Ronald Toyer, their legal team, have failed to file their cross-appeal challenging the plaintiff's appeal, which is a separate action. I don't know exactly how appeals work, but this is this is apparently a weird quirk of it where the appeal and the cross appeal challenging that appeal are separate actions they, they don't they don't correspond to one another so just because vic got an extension to his appeal doesn't mean that the opposing attorneys got an extension to their cross appeal but what this means is that if the defendants don't file their cross appeal brief and an explanation of why that brief was late by february 21st their cross appeal will be dismissed completely outright. Even if they do file by that time, if their explanation is substandard in the eyes of the court, then it will also be dismissed. Now, it's more than likely that what's really going to happen is that the appeals court is just going to grant them a retroactive extension because appeals and the courts are typically lenient when it comes to extensions. But it is interesting to see Wick Phillips drop the ball this hard. I'm not sure how, but it seems like every single time I blink, this case gets more and more ludicrous. Anyway, as with before, the court documents that I'll be looking at today will be available in the links down below for your own viewing pleasure. The documents we'll be looking at themselves are as follows. Plaintiff's response to defendant's TCPA motions to dismiss. Plaintiff's second amended petition. Plaintiff's supplement to plaintiff's second amended petition. Now, a note about this, we'll be mostly looking at the plaintiff's second amended petition, as it's basically just an updated version of the response to the TCPA. It's also better organized. The supplement is also just that, a supplement that adds new files to the case. It only really tacks on some files that went missing weirdly between the response to defendant's TCPA and the second amended petition, but I'll be making notes of distinctions wherever necessary while reviewing the second amended petition so you know kind of where we stand. There's not really too much to distinguish. If I miss a detail you feel was important, please don't be afraid to let me know in the comments down below. Feel free to comment your thoughts on the matter as well. Nothing much more worth noting beyond that, so let's dive right in. Mignana's Exhibit A covers a lot of different pieces of information at once. The first piece of information is a timeline, which is very straightforward, and of course it favors the plaintiff in every way a timeline possibly could much like the defense had their own timeline and their own evidence. The next is a series of email exchanges between Monica Rial and Tammy Denbo, as well as Rial and Lisa Gibson. Most of these conversations revolve around Monica arranging a conversation with Denbo for the investigation around January 23rd, and then adding information that later came to mind after that phone call. This extra information seems to report that her friend was kissed on site by Mignana and was remaining silent until an anonymity could be guaranteed. Additionally, she mentioned a moment where a man named Donald Schultz went on a rant about silence equaling consent in the Okatron 5000 recording studio, suggesting there may be recordings of that rant. Monica's January 30th conversation with Lisa Gibson seems mostly focused around Monica wishing to speak out and give a public statement, since she keeps getting bombarded with people asking questions in relation to Vic's situation at that point in time, considering the accusations coming out against him. After this is a large bulk of evidence that details Monica complaining about large swaths of harassment she received ever since being tied to the Vic situation. This includes a crank call that sounded to her legitimately threatening, supposed threats from other Twitter users, and the attention of Nicholas Riqueda, the law shock jockey. This comes with attached screen caps. Exhibit B details a number of Monica's tweets, as well as tweets by other users in response to Funimation's public announcement regarding the separation with Vic Mignogna. Highlights include Monica stating there were multiple investigations with testimony, proof, and evidence. Her infamous reply where she stated, Thanks for the tweet. I've screenshot it and sent it to my attorney and law enforcement. I will not be harassed. Have a nice night. And about 12 to 15 tweets responding to her accusations about Vic, all of which doubt her statements. 
C is the affidavit slash unsworn declaration of Christopher Slaytosh. Now there is a bit of contention with what this is. In the original filing, that is the very first filing, the first response to the TCPA motion to dismiss, this was an affidavit as sworn by Ty Beard. Now, there's a few things that went wrong with this and a number of other affidavits that became unsworn declarations. What happened is that Ty Beard, the attorney for Vic Mignogna, got these declarations over the phone and then signed them as he witnessed them, as any lawyer does in order to justify an affidavit. Now, the two things that are wrong with that is you can't do that over the phone and it is poor form for the attorney who is presiding over the case to sign an affidavit just in case they need to be called as a witness to witness that these affidavits were in fact said by the person they said that they could be. Now, type this is a reason why the second amended petition came into play. The original response to the TCPA was withdrawn in order to correct these changes. Uh, what is done was more or less a clerical error than anything else and was corrected, but the adjustments were not sure if the second amended petition was shot down or not as the defense tried to get done. So basically it ended up that the initial affidavits were just poor form and not admissible under court order. However, Unsworn declarations are basically just an affidavit, but there's no attorney that witnessed it being said. The big thing about that is it's only really challengeable by the party that that said the things in the unsworn declaration. So unless Christopher Slaytosh comes out and challenges what's said in this unsworn declaration, it, it's legally fine. You usually, you just have a lawyer there to ensure that it is the person, in fact, saying it. So, I don't think we're going to see any kind of change on that. They were intended to be affidavits. I don't think anything's going to be made of this. Regardless, this is the unsworn declaration of Christopher Slaytosh. Christopher Slaytosh and his company Silverfire are the owners of the Kamea Khan Convention, which is just... Kamea Convention. I'm not entirely sure how you say Khan when it's Khan in the freight. I don't know. Attached to this is the agreement between Kamea Khan and Vic for the guest appearance on April 12th, 14th, 2019. This agreement was executed in 2018. The dates for Kamea Khan in the agreement are incorrect, but both parties were in agreement on the correct dates, so there was no issue. He also testifies that Rial was also scheduled to appear. From February 2019 to April 11th, 2019, Slaytosh had multiple conversations with Ron Toyer and Monica Rial by phone, and several text conversations with Toyer. The text message exchanges are attached to the affidavit. In these conversations, Toyer repeatedly asserted that Vic was a predator and criminal charges would soon be filed against him. Toyer urged termination of Vic's appearance, even after being told it would violate the contract with Vic. Toyer insists that said criminal charges would be filed before April 12th, 14th, 2019. In these conversations, Toye encouraged Slaytosh not to conduct business with Vic in the future. Slaytosh participated in a phone conversation with Rial in which she repeatedly asserted that Vic was a sexual predator and that charges were coming. She also implied, and he inferred, she would convince other voice actors to cancel appearances at KameaCon. During this conversation, Toye could be heard in the background conferring with Rial on the matter at hand. Termination of multiple actors at the very last minute would have severely threatened KameaCon's profitability. Ultimately, the threat appeared to be credible as multiple guests did in fact pull out. Slaytosh informed both Rial and Toye of Vic being under contract with Silverfire, and yet they continued to urge Silverfire to breach the contract. Toye also implied his company would withdraw a sponsorship of $25,000 if the contract was not breached. The sponsorship ultimately did not materialize. Silverfire did in fact breach the contract with Vic, but after a threat of litigation from Vic's counsel, uh, as well as long negotiations and legal expenses, Vic was returned to the convention under a number of restrictions. This included paying for additional security, not participating in panel discussions, signing a different in a different location, and so on. As a result of this compromise, a number of voice actors mentioned by Rial cancelled their appearances. Attached to the declaration, Slaytosh provided a copy of his contract with Vic that was violated and screenshots of several conversations he had with Ronald Toye. Highlights of these screenshots include the following. 
accusations that Vic assaulted three close friends of Renault Toyer, including Monica Rial, an initial offer to sponsor Slaytasha's convention, only to withdraw the offer if Vic wasn't removed from the convention, multiple mentions of an investigation happening behind closed doors, and the moment that Ronald Toyer was informed that Vic and the convention were under contract. There's also a statement by Slaytosh that Vic was cancelled specifically because of statements made by Ronald Toyer during their conversation. Exhibit D is the affidavit slash unsworn declaration of Chuck Huber. Chuck opens this declaration by clarifying he does not condone Vic's behavior in relation to his infidelity with Michelle Specht. He has been a voice actor at Funimation since 1998, has starred over in over 200 roles, and has attended over 150 conventions. He is friends with several Funimation employees with direct communication to former CEO Gen Fukunaga, Karen Mika, Justin Cook, and Colleen Clinkenbeard. He has been an employee of Okatron 5000, Chris Sabat's company, since 2004, and Deep Space Mustache, a film company founded by Sabat, between 2012 and 2013. He has been friends with Vic, Rial, and Marky for at least 10 years. He is aware of Toye thanks to Rial's relationship with him. The first time he heard of Vic was while recording for Funimation while at Okatron 5000 in 2003 or 2004. Chris Sabat stated Vic was a pedophile that liked little girls but did not express concern for fans, which Huber found odd. There was no mention of specific instances where Vic committed sexual harassment, sexual assault, or inappropriate behavior. In 2007, Vic began autographing artwork depicting his characters for money at conventions. Initially, other actors and employees, including the defendant and Sabat, called this stealing from fans, using fans, or being an asshole. Later, everyone would adopt and currently follow this practice. He says this behavior is demonstrative of long-standing negative opinions about Vic. While Vic was not present, conversation about him was typically disparaging. Typically, there were comments made on his clothing being gay, being a diva, being a prima donna, and a douche. Additionally, there were comments on his purported infidelity his conservative Christian beliefs, and his support of Donald Trump. All these statements were made by Rial, Marquis Sabat, or others at one time or another. They did concede his ability to do his job, however. In December 2013 at Yamakan during lunch with Sean Schemmel and Sony Strait, Sean tried to persuade Chuck into a derogatory video about Vic known as Vince Mangina VA Pedophile Video, which would portray Vic as a pedophile. Chuck refused because Vic was a friend and not a pedophile. Often when interacting with Schemmel, Schemmel would attack Vic for pushing Christian beliefs and for sexual promiscuity. In 2016 at Funimation, he witnessed a producer warn other employees of Vic's arrival and address Vic negatively with directors. Approximately around 2016 and 2017, a Funimation director told Chuck that Vic would never get a job directing at Funimation because he was such a douche. Chuck advised Vic of the conversation and Vic told him to address it with Justin Cook of Funimation's managerial staff. In Chuck Huber's opinion, the voice actors and employees of Funimation he detailed were overly preoccupied with disparaging Vic. Over the last decade, Chuck was around Vic, the defendants, and other Funimation employees hundreds of times. Until January 2019, there were no direct accusations of sexual assault or harassment while in Chuck's presence. Prior to 2019, negative discussion about Vic in Chuck's presence was filled with laughter and derision, never concerned for the victim. Vic was treated as a joke and not a threat. Vic indicated to Chuck he had received no warning about his behavior in his 20 years of employment. Chuck was informed by Vic that in 2018, Vic contacted a Funimation producer over any behavioral issues there might have been, and there was no mention of sexual harassment, sexual assault, or inappropriate behavior at or outside of Funimation. He was informed he was difficult to work with because he asked for additional takes beyond the normal voice actor. He attests that senior Funimation directors have attested that Funimation's environment was a den of poison, a Kafka nightmare, and an Orwellian slave factory. Huber's employment at Funimation was unpleasant. Falling out of favor with certain people, including Chris Sabat, or attempting to change working conditions would typically result in that person not being rehired. Chuck feared not being hired if he complained about the work environment. He states Funimation posted no employment policies regarding sexual harassment in the workplace, nor did they provide any employee handbook to Vic, Marky Rial, or himself. In his 20 years of employment, it was very common for employees and talent to hug and kiss each other at the offices. Raunchy comedy was extremely common. Sexual relationships between the employees and talent were common. There was no discipline or termination for this conduct. After Sony's acquisition of Funimation, a no-hugs policy was put in place, but it was ignored early on. Talent and employees at Funimation talked and flirted freely and regularly, though this did taper after Sony's no-hugs policy. During recording for Dragon Ball Kai in 2007, 
Chuck heard rumors actresses had been recast at Funimation for refusing sexual advances by employees. Based on his experience working at Funimation and direct messages with a former DBZ cast member, he considers these rumors credible. He also heard actresses who participated in sex acts with Funimation and Okatron 5000 employees were cast in roles. He considers these rumors credible as well. When the trailer for Dragon Ball Super Brawly released, Vic was not the actor for Brawly, even though he was the only English actor who had played Brawly to that point. In this time, Chuck communicated with Sabat, who responded, If it has anything to do with Vic, I will not talk about it. Sabat did most of the casting and recording for Dragon Ball properties, including Super Brawly. Sabat engaged in negotiations with Toei, owners of the Dragon Ball properties, for various projects. Voice actors at Funimation generally consider Sabat a de facto manager at Funimation and his approval is vital in succeeding at Funimation and conventions and the converse regarding his disapproval. He says that Sabat has more influence at Funimation and other studios including Rooster Teeth and Toei than Vic has ever had in the anime industry. He says that Sabat and Shemmel called Vic a pedophile numerous times before January 2019's allegations. He claims that Sabat has a habit of talking derogatorily about Funimation management and friends. Huber heard of no specific allegations against Vic or victims of Vic before 2019. He was a close friend and writing partner with Jamie Markey since 2009, and she never mentioned the hair-pulling incident. He believes she would have mentioned it if it had bothered her as she is outspoken. Additionally, she, Rial, and other employees frequently expressed animosity towards Vic, but never claimed he sexually harassed or sexually assaulted anyone. All animosity appeared based on personality conflicts, sexual promiscuity, Christian faith, and the difficulty of working with him. In 2009, Huber worked with Marky and Sabat on Con.com, a website for voice actors to provide content to fans. Vic was a prominent guest and a primary marketing force mostly due to his convention schedule. There was no concern over Vic's supposed pedophilia or criminal sexual behavior at that time. Huber has never seen Vic behave inappropriately with fans of any age. Huber saw no action to confront Vic or concern for convention fans from Funimation employees until 2019. The sexual assault and sexual harassment allegations by defendants have seriously damaged Vic's career, inducing numerous conventions to cancel appearances and inducing producers and directors to not hire him or even fire him. Marky, Rial, Huber, and most all other voice actors have kissed and hugged hundreds of fans at conventions regardless of age. Huber was initially supportive of Marky and Rial because they were trying to help the alleged underage victims of rape and sexual assault by Vic, which they and Michelle Specht told him existed, who would otherwise be too afraid to speak out. He never considered Rial or Marky victims of attempted rape or sexual assault. Huber drafted a proposed statement for Vic that included the phrase, I am a sex addict, because his discussions with Rial and Marky convinced him Vic would have to admit to some form of guilt for them to settle. Vic never saw, nor approved of, the phrase. Huber claims to not be educated or an expert on sex addiction. Huber discussed sex addiction with Vic and now believes his sexual promiscuity is more closely associated to common narcissism and ego from men in his position. He does believe Vic is sincere in his efforts to correct moral failings with his counselor. During Huber's attempt to settle both sides, Todd Haberkorn informed him via email, attached to the declaration, that Sabat, Toye, and Schimmel told him he was in danger of losing his job at Funimation after retaining some the same lawyers as Vic. Hubert fears his 20 years at Funimation would be damaged by retaliation for associating with Vic. Hubert contacted Gen Fukunaga, the then CEO of Funimation, to discuss concerns with Sabat gaslighting Schimmel, damaging use of authority, and attempts to destroy Hubert's career in early March 2019. Gen informed Huber Vic would lose the case via an anti-slap motion and rebuffed concerns about Sabat, having been Sabat's friend for 17 years. This occurred March 7, 2019 at 2.30pm in Gen's office approximately a month to a month and a half after Vic filed the pending lawsuit. Huber fears direct, planned, and specific retaliation from Sabat in relation to his, his declaration that may damage Huber's career. Huber does not believe Vic has pursued anyone sexually past the point of being told no. He does believe Vic used his position in shameful ways in order to obtain sex. In Huber's experience with Vic, if someone did not want to be hugged or kissed, he would stop immediately. He was advised more than once by Funimation employees, including Riol, Marky, and Specht, since February 2019 that criminal charges were coming to Vic. He encouraged them to help alleged underage victims of rape and sexual assault to come forward. When he asked for them to provide specifics to the allegations, they couldn't or refused to do so. When informed of the contents of Tammy Dembo's investigation, Huber's opinion was that Funimation, Marky, and Riel acted together with encouragement from Sabat and Schemmel to destroy Vic's career and life. 
He believes incidents reportedly investigated by Dembo occurred outside of Funimation or before Sony's acquisition. Huber does not believe Vic kissed Sarah Bachmeyer without her consent, nor has he ever heard rumors of Vic being sexually inappropriate at Funimation. Huber believes that Funimation supported the accusations against Vic through their February 11th, 2019 tweet. He believes that Marky, Rial, and Toye have been speaking with Funimation's tacit or overt consent in tweets made by them since January 2019. The next piece of evidence is the unsworn declaration of Victor Mignogna. In this document, Vic emphatically denies attempting or doing the following. Sexually assaulting or sexually harassing anyone. Physically assaulting any women. Force anyone to kiss him, hug him, or engage in sexual activity. Fondle, kiss without consent, or otherwise have inappropriate contact with underage people or adults inappropriately touch, rub, stroke, strike, any female fans, guests, staff, or acquaintances, sexual contact with anyone without consent, sexually assault, sexually harass, touch inappropriately, or have non-consensual contact with Rial or Markey. He has read Jamie Markey's July 18th, 2019 affidavit and claims the following. He never grabbed her hair and pulled it down. He never whispered into her ear sexual suggestions or violent statements. He never pressed his lips to her ear, as she claims. He was contacted by Tammy Denbo on January 25th, 2019 for an interview regarding several allegations reported against him. Discussed were the following. An accusation he ate a jelly bean thrown at him by Monica Rial in a sexually suggestive manner. He stated to Denbo he did not eat it in a sexual way, made no sexual suggestive comments, and no one, including Rial, appeared to interpret the action or comments as being sexual in nature. An accusation he invited two adult female fans who had previously flirted with him a number of times to his hotel room at a convention, then sexually harassed or assaulted them. He stated to Dembo he did not sexually harass or assault them. He expressed romantic interest in them and they declined the offer and left. He did not harass, intimidate, or pressure them in any way whatsoever. An accusation he kissed Funimation employee Sarah Bachmeyer without her consent in her office. He told Dembo they shared a single consensual kiss and there was no coercion. Following the conversation, he emailed Dembo about the investigation and that email was reattached via the supplement to the Second Amendment petition. Prior to the consensual kiss, Vic and Bachmeyer corresponded via text, calls, and in person for at least a year or more. She appeared to welcome his interest in her, leading him to ask to kiss her. She agreed, and the two have only kissed once. She has not expressed any outrage or anger at him since. Dembo did not inquire about any other incidents. In particular, she did not mention the purported attempted sexual assault in 2007 against Rial, alleged in Rial's affidavit nor did she mention the alleged hair-pulling incidents by Marky or Riol. He was also assured the investigation and results would remain confidential. Vic was called Saturday, January 26, 2019, and informed he was terminated from Funimation. By mid-January 2019, he had dozens of contracts with conventions to appear. At least a dozen cancelled by the filing of the lawsuit. He then lists four more that also cancelled. He lists a number of conventions he appeared at in 2019 with associated amounts earned, totaling approximately $161,000 between 11 conventions. He describes what he claims are reasonable estimates for what monetary losses he has incurred by not attending five of the conventions that have cancelled. He states that all cancellations were attributed to the allegations of sexual assault being made by the defendants, according to convention managers. Additionally, several mentioned Funimation's investigation as further motivation. He states to have never been cancelled from a convention before 2018. He claims to have no memory of Robin Michelle Blankenship or the events she describes in her affidavit. Having read the affidavit of Kara Edwards, he claims no improper acts as she claims he committed and refutes sexually assaulting her. He says he never engaged in any contact without her consent. Having read the affidavit of Lynn Hunt, he denies all improper conduct allegations. Having read the affidavit of Faisal Ahmed, he denies being overly friendly with female cosplayers, behaving inappropriately with Erica McCord, Kelly Loftus, or Leia Hamilton. Having read the affidavit of Mary Reese, he denies all claims he engaged in manipulating or tricking young girls, being demanding, being a bully, being intentionally rude to her, grabbing Kara Edwards' hair and forcefully pulling it back, demanding Kara's table be moved, and so on. Having read Whitney Falba's affidavit, he denies all improper conduct she claims he engaged in. Having read the affidavit of Nesha Perry, he denies all improper conduct she claims he engaged in. I, kept, I didn't realize this, but I kept writing clams instead of claims in my summary here. Delicious, I love clams. Having read the affidavit of Emmett Platt, he denies all improper conduct uh, he claims he engaged in. 
Having read the affidavit of Adam Sheehan, he denies all the inappropriate conduct he claims that he engaged in. Having read the affidavit of Kelly Loftus, he denies he ever hit on her, inappropriate conduct she claims he engaged in, including hugging, touching, or kissing her without her consent. Having read the affidavit of John Prager, he denies all claims of impropriety. Having read the affidavits of Elizabeth and Teresa Yost, he denies touching them without their consent or inappropriately. He did invite them to his room after they flirted with him numerous times over the previous year, but bid them farewell after they made their lack of interest clear. He did not ask them to do a strip show for him or try to kiss them. He did not express a desire to kiss them or become angry at them. They never cried, teared up, or acted afraid in his presence. He claims to have been diagnosed with depression and prescribed Zoloft as a result of the stress and anguish caused by the defendant's defamatory assertions. He has never asked his fans to harass, attack, or mistreat anyone. In late 2017, he asked Colleen Clinkenbeard why he was not cast more often. She responded that they didn't like the cast actors who weren't local, and some directors thought he was difficult because he occasionally requested additional takes. She stated there were no other concerns about his conduct and mentioned no inappropriate conduct. He told Chuck Huber of this meeting. Until the January 25th, 2019 communication with Denbo, Vic had never been reprimanded for any kind of conduct. That's the affidavit of Vic Mignogna. We'll be hearing a lot of the same stuff when we finally get to his deposition, but again, depositions are going to be retrading a lot of information we've already learned. It's just going to be the direct statements from the person themselves. So uh, look forward to that in a future installment. Exhibit F is a little weird. It appears to be the Discord chat logs as recorded by Twitter user at DBZ UK Kame House from his time as part of the Kick Vic movement. These records purport to show a secret group with Jimmy Markey, who goes by She-Devil in the chats, and Shane Holmberg. Additionally, it appears Jesse Primeward is also present in these chats. The details of these chats are scattered. A lot has been bereft of the surrounding context, so making heads or tails of what they're really talking about is difficult. From what I can parse, uh, there is in some way some form of coordination going on in this Discord server to post tweets with certain types of content, specifically things that wouldn't damage Marky getting more conventions. There's also some complaints by Pride more over her girlfriend leaving her and her convention career getting destroyed. These conversations apparently happened sometime around February 24th, 2019. If someone else understands more of what the context of these discussions are, I would love to hear it and see more of that evidence. But for now, this is all I have open for it. And there's going to be a few other pieces of evidence that feel just as lacking. Exhibit G is a collection of Jimmy Markey's tweets. Now, some of these we've already touched upon in previous installments of this series, so I'll only hit some of the highlights. Included are the following. Her tweets calling for Vic's head, among other things. A comprehensive statement of her version of events involving the hair pulling incident at Funimation's lobby. Refutation of Vic saying she's lying. And a myriad of tweets responding to her, doubting her story or supporting her emotionally, as well as her response to those. Anyone who questions her story is typically met with a snarky comeback or an accusation of harassment. Exhibit H is a set of Twitter DMs between Jimmy Markey and an unnamed user. It seems to be Markey in denial that Vic is going to bring a lawsuit, as well as defending herself and her accusations with statements like, I have pink stripes in my hair, which I think is fucking cute. I'm not kidding, that is something she tries to use to defend her position, I think? She also doesn't know how to use the enter key. At all. This is really weird. And it's also really weird to have as evidence. So overall, I'm just confused why this is here. Exhibit I is the deposition of Monica Rial with attached evidence. Again, we'll get that to that and the other depositions in a future part, but I'll go over them. Exhibit J is the deposition of Ronald Toyer with over 400 pages of his tweets. Let's scroll through that now just so you guys can comprehend how many tweets they are bringing up Ronald Toye on for defamation charges. Now this is just his deposition. This is just him talking and being asked questions. Not his tweets. But as we go down... Jesus Christ, come on. Come on, you only have 200 pages in this. Alright, here we go. Tweet time. Tweet, 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 tweet. So many tweets. This man was absolutely prolific with how many tweets he made in relation to the Vic Mignogna situation. So, you can obviously understand why I'm not going to bother reading through all of these, even when I do get the deposition. I'm not going to touch on all of these. 
seriously, you can read for yourself. There are some in here that I think probably don't count as defamatory, but I can understand a lawyer being very, very uh, aggressive with cataloging evidence just in case something might slip under the radar. Oh, Jesus Christ, my finger is falling asleep here. Can I just... Uh, can I... Oh, 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 there we go, there we go. Took forever, didn't it? The next piece of evidence is the deposition of Victor Mignogna. Again, depositions we'll get to later. Exhibit L are more tweets by Monica Rial, namely a promise that the truth will come out now. All of it. Exhibit M are even more tweets by Jamie Markey, claiming Vic is a master manipulator of his fans and that she has no sympathy for Vic getting harassment. Exhibit N are even more tweets by Monica Rial, nothing we haven't covered before in previous videos, so... There. Exhibit O is the affidavit of Stan Dolan, not an unsworn declaration. This one was properly done and handled, so... There's that. Stan Dolan is the owner of Azumicon in November 2007 in Oklahoma City. He has read Monica Rial's response to plaintiff's request for information, known as an interrogatory, where she states her assault story with Vic. It is attached as Exhibit A of this affidavit. So there's an exhibit within this exhibit. That This happened a lot recently in this. He confirms both Rial and Vic were guests at the convention. He has no memories of Monica Rial's description of events. If he had noticed her being distressed leaving Vic's room as she alleged that Stan did, he is certain he would have remembered it. In subsequent years, he invited both back to his convention several times, but would not have done so if informed of problems between Rial and Vic. This comes with attached interrogatory response from the defense, where Dolan is named by Monica Rial as a partial witness to the events that occurred between Vic and her at Azumicon in 2007. Exhibit P is the unsworn declaration of Erica Nicole McCord. She said that she has never been the personal handler or assistant for Vic. Any time that she had as a handler was at a convention or as a representative of that convention. The only person she was answerable to was the person in charge of guest relations at said conventions. She has never been on the same plane as Vic, nor flown to a convention where she was his handler. Three conventions have flown her to venues, two of which were owned by Faisal Ahmed, and she was not Vic's handler at those conventions, nor at the third convention, ColossalCon. She has never been a die-hard fan of Vic. Her prolific work with Vic was due solely to a strong understanding of the venues and or understanding of Vic's idiosyncrasies as they relate to conventions. Her involvement with Star Trek Continues was because of her love of Star Trek and belief that she would be acting as an organizer and liaison for cast and crew transportation. She has no memory of making a request to no longer be assigned to Vic to Ahmed. It would have been out of character for her to communicate directly with Ahmed about anything at a staff meeting. This statement was made to Natalie Aukerman, Director of Guest Relations in charge of American and Japanese guest handlers at Anime Weekend Atlanta and several of Faisal's other conventions. The reason for her request dealt with being pigeonholed into handling Vic at conventions. She wanted the opportunity to work with other guests. Volunteering on an episode of Star Trek Continues and working with him at another event was just for a change of pace. She has no memory of saying to Ahmed, Vic was not who I thought he was. She would not have made such statements to Ahmed. She has never been afraid of Vic, nor has he ever forcibly kissed her without consent. This statement comes with attached copy of Faisal Ahmed's affidavit for comparison. Exhibit Q is a previously touched upon tweet by Jamie Markey detailing Vic's assault against her. And that all of my friends and viewers are all the relevant pieces of evidence as presented by Vic Mignogna. The next video will be an in-depth dissection of the three depositions given for this case by Vic Mignogna, Monica Rial, and Ronald Toyer. Because of their length, detail, and presence among all the relevant evidence pools, I've decided to cordon them off into their own video. If you found this recap informative, please like this video, hit that subscribe button, and ring that bell so you get updates of all of my recent works. For more consistent updates, you can find me over on Twitter at Ruby McNeil, where I post a lot of really stupid crap, but also updates as to everything going on here on YouTube, so it's probably a hit or miss situation, but you probably want to do that. You go, go ahead, go ahead, follow me over there. Additionally, if you want to contribute directly to the channel, you can always donate to my Patreon at patreon.com slash Celtic Phoenix. 
For $1 or more, you get access to the Team Frostbite Discord server with the Tundra, where I, as well as many other YouTube personalities from other channels, interact regularly with our fans. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll catch you all in the next video.